Good evening and welcome to the University of Sheffield. I'm an applied statistician in the School of Mathematics and Statistics here at the University. My research involves helping other applied scientists to manage and interpret their data. The reason they need such help is that almost all scientific data are associated with key uncertainties which must be described, formalised and managed if the data are to be used to provide interpretations which really move research forward. Given this, applied statisticians routinely hear colleagues tell interesting stories about the part that uncertainty plays in their work. Most scientists also discuss uncertainty in their published papers, and so we read about it all the time when we read one another's work. This evening's event was inspired by the observation that although it's clearly a key part of scientific discourse, uncertainty is really very seldom the focus of dialogue between scientists and the general public. In an attempt to change this, my statistical colleagues and I have interviewed members of the university's scientific community and then collaborated with members of Sheffield's artistic community to bring you the collection of work you'll see this evening. All of the artistic work around you is either motivated by the concept of uncertainty or is uncertain by virtue of its very nature, simply because of the way that it was created. All of the music you're about to hear is improvised and the poetry is recombinatorial which means that it will be different every time it's performed. For these reasons, no one is certain precisely what will happen here tonight. But we do know the format. You will hear interviews with my scientific colleagues interleaved with improvised music and poetry. We very much hope you enjoy the show. Perhaps you'd like to start by telling us a little bit about you and about your research in general. So, I'm a polymer chemist, so I study long chain molecules uh, in various contexts. So, sometimes it's um, how they're organised, how the molecules are organised, and it's kind of the physics that we're interested in. Sometimes it's the applications, so how you can process molecules and, and make different shapes. Um, so, I've worked with tissue engineers to make mm -hmm. scaffolds, people who do drug delivery to make capsules. Uh, with people who make uh, running shoes to make foam. So does your team include people from a range of backgrounds on a daily basis, yeah. your local team? Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of um, people that are in your team? So, so they'll range from people doing synthetic chemistry, I mean real, you know, making molecules, cooking. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be people who build instruments, um, and there'll be people who, who make measurements at the synchrotron or the neutron source and they're really physicists mm -hmm. uh, and then there'll be people doing mathematical modelling mm -hmm. um, if it's a project that involves drug delivery or tissue engineering then there'll be biologists um, tissue culture folk mm -hmm. all of those involved too so it's mm -hmm. a really really broad team and the hardest part of the dialogue is making sure everyone's speaking a common argot yes as you know, we're talking about uncertainty in this series of interviews, and so I'd be interested to hear whether you think uncertainty is something that you explore or even embrace in the research that you do, or whether it's really something that you want to just minimise because it's causing problems. So, so there's two answers to this question. The first is, if you're doing measurements, um, and often in the, in the very academic part of my research we are doing measurements mm -hmm. and so we know that there's an inherent uncertainty in the measurements, you know, there's, there's the, the statistics of making the measurement and, uh, and we would generally um, make sure that in the data collection process we collected the statistics and knew what the uncertainty was so that if we were fitting a model to the data um, we could then accommodate that model inside the uncertainty in the data. Yeah. The second is I do a lot of work in uh, public understanding of science um, and in, in the project about catalytic clothing so using um, as a chemist right so I look at someone's clothes um, not as self actualization uh, but as a catalyst support because the fibers are really really thin and uh, and so there's a high surface area to volume ratio so I have a project running at the moment to coat people's clothing with tiny uh, catalysts made from titania and these, these titania catalysts are 10 nanometers in diameter 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so the service area is enormous. Yeah. And uh, so, for example, the, the clothes I'm wearing now, if you unfold all the fibres, it's 80 square metres of service area. Yeah. So if you decorate that with catalysts. Now, now the uncertainty in this research is, will it work? <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and if it does work, will it be acceptable to the public? You know, will they be frightened off by being um, dirt magnets? Or will they be frightened off by uh, the uh, nanoparticles um, being released into the environment and not knowing what they might do? Or will they be, will they be frightened by uh, having heard Prince Charles talking about nanotechnology and grey goo and how it's going to take over the world and, you know, the new Luddites? <laughs> uh, and dealing with that uncertainty yeah. in, in, a, in a social context as opposed to a, a, a data analysis context yes. is, is yes. very different. Yeah, okay. So, so the, the, the classic thing here is the overuse of the precautionary principle. You know, I, we don't know, therefore we shouldn't even try to okay. do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the way that that's put across... Um, so sometimes we're setting out, when we do experiments, we're setting out to, to test the theory. So it'll be a hypothesis. Um, and uh, and you set out, you know, you design an experiment to test the hypothesis, and that's kind of it's almost straightforward. But there's lots of um, often research happens in the in the what if mode. Um, you know, if, if if we add this bit of a molecule onto that bit of a molecule, mm-hmm. what will they do? Mm-hmm. Or um, can we build something that looks like a bacteria? Uh, in terms of being a capsule and a flagellum, mm-hmm. from things that aren't made from anything biological, so that we can understand the physics of how um, a micro scale object swims, okay. uh, and and that and not knowing, not knowing the answer before you start, um, is quite exciting. Yeah. And it's why you do what some of what you do. I and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and and that's why. And having both is good. So, so having having both those kinds of both those ways of doing research, mm-hmm. um, hypothesis led, experimental test, um, side by side with, I wonder what happens if, yeah, and they feed off each other actually. Okay. So perhaps you could say just a little bit about how researchers in your area communicate with one another about uncertainty. Is it routinely something that's made explicit? Or is it just look? We, we all know there's some there, and so and we have you have sort of an agreed set of ways of working along the lines that you just outlined. Uh-huh. So, uh-huh. or is it something that when you sort of stand up to present your work to other scientists, mm-hmm. is uncertainty part of what you feel you you ought to be talking to them about and that they're going to be interested in? So, so in in terms of um, again of testing a hypothesis and presenting data. Uh, then we would routinely have error bars mm-hmm. to deal with the uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Or if we didn't have error bars, point out that the errors are smaller than the points on the graph. Yeah. Okay. Um, and often, you know, um, discuss the meaningfulness of the data in terms of the scatter. Yeah. So, so we would explicitly deal with the uncertainty. Um, and actually, it's implicit that if the, if the error is not discussed or presented then that error is assumed to be very very small mm-hmm. the 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 error in terms of the experimental error one chooses whether to acknowledge the uncertainty mm-hmm. and use the uncertainty in the research mm-hmm. uh, so or, or in, in in making things you know so for example electronics wouldn't work without quantum mechanics mm-hmm. quantum mechanics doesn't work without uncertainty right however uh, a steam engine uh, needs the certainty of the second law in yeah. order to work. Yeah. And it just depends on what scale you're working at, whether it's the certainty of continuum mechanics mm-hmm. or the uncertainty of quantum mechanics. Okay. For example, with catalytic clothing, you know, if, if you do get nanoparticles in the sewerage system and they end up in the water treatment plant, we don't know what that will do to the microbes that clean up the water. We are going to have to investigate that. And actually, I think scientists being honest about what they don't know is rather reassuring for the people that they're talking to rather than 
um, upsetting for the people we're talking to, because at least it shows that we're honest. Well, could you please start by telling us a bit about you and your general research interests? Yes, I'm Sheila McNeil. I'm a professor of tissue engineering at the University of Sheffield. And my interest is developing soft tissues for wound healing for patients with burn injuries. Um, we also do some work on the cornea. So basically, we look at problems where the human body isn't doing a good enough job of healing itself. And we ask, can we take bits of tissue from the patient or another patient expand them up in the laboratory, take them back to the patient to achieve better healing. That, that in a nutshell is what we're up to. <laughs> Great. Within this general interest, um, is uncertainty something that you concern about? Or there? Well, um, our work spans research right through to clinical delivery. So at the point you get it to the clinic, you want there to be very little uncertainty because you don't want to be making your mistakes on the patient. But when we begin the research, there's a great deal of uncertainty. In fact, that's often the exciting bit. Um, so while you're exploring new ways to do things, you're not sure how you're going to get there. We often don't back one horse. We might, may back two or three horses at the same time. And uh, while you're playing about in the lab, we use words like play and blue Peter time and so on. <laughs> so we, we do allow ourselves to have a lot of fun in the early stages of what we're doing. And then when we think we know what we're doing, we, we repeat it enough times and then we try and drive down the uncertainty to a reasonable level. But it's actually interesting talking about certainty and the clinic because many people think, well, you should never ever go to the clinic until you know absolutely everything. And actually, that's not how life is. You reduce the uncertainty to the level where you think the risks where the benefits outweigh the risks, and that's when you go to the clinic. Indeed. So that means that probably in your universe, uh, uncertainty is part, is a part it, of the it fabric. Defini it definitely is, yes. But very often when we start out on a particular project, like we're currently working with colleagues in India, trying to develop a carrier membrane for delivering patient cells to the eye. And we know in broad terms what we want this membrane to do. It's got to be able to support cells, eventually it's got to fade away and not be a nuisance so that the cells end up on the eye and the membrane's gone. So we have a destination, we know where we're going to go, where we want to go, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. And, and that's very, very typical of the sort of projects we take on. Now it's always good to have a destination, it's always good to have a worthwhile destination because that harnesses people. But then right at the beginning you may think, how are we going to do this? I don't know. How are we going to do this? I don't know. Now saying I don't know is never a problem. I would much rather people say, I don't know, and dream up half a dozen ideas. Um, because as research scientists, we actually enjoy that, and we enjoy exploring alternatives. And very often, as if you write a grant, you'll say, we're going to do this, and that's going to work, we're going to do that. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, you, I can often see the first two or three bridges that I'm going to yeah. cross. And I may write in a grant that I know exactly how it's going to go, but I don't think we've ever delivered one like that exactly. Um, sometimes the things that go wrong provide you with the best opportunities for that project or another project. So we are constantly on the lookout for things going wrong going in inverted wrong. commas. That will give you some sort of opportunity to yes. explore further things yes. that you probably didn't envisage at the beginning. Absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. You have contact with different uh, scientists or collaborators yes. along these, uh, uh, these research schemes. Uh, is there a specific way that you convey uncertainty or different kinds of, of uncertainty to them? That, that's actually a very good question because the answer to that is it very much depends on who we're communicating with. Now, if we go to near the end of the project and I'm talking to a burn surgeon about getting cells back to the clinic, it will go badly if I say, on one hand, we could do this. Oh, we could do that. Oh, we might do that. So with a burn surgeon, I have to say, we've sorted this, this and this and in six months we'll be ready to do this. And you might draw it or write it, but you need to keep it quite simple mm -hmm. And because the burn surgeons, they've got a whole lot of problems of their own and it's all about risk management. So whereas as a scientist, they might engage in problem solving and creative play, as a clinician, they can't afford to. They've got to know that there's a high likelihood it will do no harm and it may do some benefit. Now the other end of the line, 
when I'm dealing with one of my colleagues, um, a polymer chemist, materials engineer, we will sit down together, we will make some time and we will draw and we will draw cartoons and usually, usually it's pictorial. We mm -hmm. can do it. No, no, no. And someone else sees the pen off you and et cetera, et cetera. And that's great. And we deliberately allow ourselves to play at that point because it's great to have a whole lot of ideas and it's best done sat around a table and drawing. And then you can later tidy those up. And as you start to put some text into them, you think, oh, actually, that one's not worth doing. But that, that is worth a play. Great. Uh, and I, I was thinking about that because, uh, well, now probably that you're a bit more familiar with these kinds of things, it's, uh, it has varied the way you teach how to deal with uncertainty to people around you, your uh, uh, students, uh, compared to how you understand you understood it, you were taught at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Is that is is that the case? Um yes, I guess within if I'll I'll start off really within my own research group where I have um, a lot of PhD students going through their training on how to do research. So I very much try and build a culture of people telling me what the results were, the good, the bad and the ugly. Mm -hmm. It's not so much it failed or it went wrong. You can learn as much often from the experiment that didn't succeed as you expected as from the one that worked perfectly. So for someone to say, well, I tried that and it didn't work out, is not an admission of failure. It's, oh, what did you get? So we build a culture in which people report how it went. And sometimes, sometimes things went as they expected. That's great. And other times they really didn't. And sometimes you think, well, don't worry about it, just repeat it. But if they've repeated it a few times and it's still not doing what you expected, then it's time to sort of dig everything out of the waste bin and look at it and work out what actually went on. So in a research environment, I think that's part of a healthy culture. Now, if we go to an undergraduate environment, um, many undergraduates will get very annoyed at you if you say, we're not sure about this. What they want to know is, do I need to know this for my exams? <laughs> so depending whether I'm teaching first year, second year or third year, um, I will often say, say in third year students, I'll say, well, when it comes to this aspect of angiogenesis, everybody's agreed that da, 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 da. However, when it comes to this, no one really knows. The jury's out. It's too early, folks. That's why we don't know. So if you're teaching a third year class, they can cope with that. If you do too much of that in the first year, you lose them. So it's something that you learn how to deal with. And yes. And, and also, people will self-select, well, Many people going into research will be attracted to uncertainty. Yeah. Other people, if they want to become an accountant, they will, oh no, that really <laughs> isn't for me. <laughs> and, uh, so I think, you know, even if you want to become an accountant, you still need to deal with uncertainty, definitely. But you may choose not to be attracted to it. Yes. Your whole job is making an uncertain world more certain. Whereas a research scientist, we actually do embrace uncertainty. Great. And so there's some a specific points where you seek uh, collaboration with different people uh, in the basis of dealing or trying to understand or to tame uncertainty. Oh, oh, certain oh definitely. Very often it's when the knowledge that we have of an area is really incomplete and we know or suspect that someone else has got a good knowledge set or a new set of toys that would help us. Um, so if we're wanting to develop a new biomaterial to detect bacteria or so on, we will, we know that we're going to have to deal with people who know about bacteria and who know about polymers. So I will very often set up collaborations with colleagues within this university, other universities, overseas, uh, where people have got different and complementary skill sets. If, if you've got a big destination in mind, um, then that can help and you can get, you can get a team of scientists sit down together in which one person will say, well, I don't know anything about so and so, but I'm quite good on wounds, and I know about etc. So you may put an interdisciplinary team together to tackle a problem that you couldn't do from one discipline alone. And again, that sort of tallies with the fact of conveying these different aspects Abs of uncertainty to each absolutely. other. Absolutely, absolutely. Right? And you can have a great deal of fun working in interdisciplinary teams if people want to engage. Um, you can't make people work outside of their comfort zone happily. 
it just you can try but it just doesn't work <laughs> you're much better off finding someone who does want to go outside of their comfort zone and who actually does want to tackle a problem that they can't solve just from their own skill set I was uh, I'm curious about because you mentioned uh, a minute ago uh, that probably some people would have new toys and like yes. that. so yeah uh, does that reduce the, ins the uncertainty you're dealing with or do you still have some sort of uh, uh, unknowns that will still be there, no matter how fine, how I, precise I, I think, you could do. I think there will always be some unknowns. I mean, it, I could, act, I guess, um, answer that best by looking at the world of microscopy. As microscopy has got better and better and better, you can see right down from sort of sections of tissues through to cells to inside cells to, and you can see right down to a much much finer degree. So if seeing something in more detail helps you, and I say if, because it doesn't always, <laughs> then that, that, that can be great and that can reduce uncertainty. Um, if you're talking new toys, there's a, there's a very interesting stage in any new toy or new technology, inkjet printing or proteomics or genomics, the new toy is suddenly going to solve all of the mysteries of the universe, including chill blades. Now, you, there's always a learning curve, and I must admit, I'm a bit of a technophobe, so I sort of hang back a bit mm -hmm. until it's a few years down the line, because um, I'm not interested in new toys for the sake of new toys. I'm very much interested in, will the new toy be useful for solving the problem? So you nearly always have to, with whatever a new toy or technique is, it nearly always needs a few years before people find out what it really does and what it doesn't do. And that then becomes the useful point at which you can play with people. I think man has this desire to live in a well-ordered, well-regulated universe um, because it makes you think maybe that you're in control. But of course we don't live in a well-organized, well-regulated universe. The complexity out there is very much greater I think than anyone's brain can, can tackle. So I think the desire for order is easily understood and um, we impose order on our environment and reduce uncertainty so that we are unlikely to have a car crash when we drive from A to B. Um, but the fact that as a scientist I'm aware that there's so much more going on, even in every system I play with and I get to work, have I got it to work because I understand every aspect of it? Probably not. It's more like me driving my car from A to B. Do I understand exactly how the car works and how all of those encounters I nearly had didn't happen? No. No. So I'm aware that there's a heck of a lot of uncertainty um, in the world. Um, we manage it to a working degree. And as I guess as research scientists, we reduce the uncertainty to the point where we think, well, if a decent student did that experiment half a dozen times, they'd probably get the same result. But I'm saying the word probably in there, you know. <laughs>